Thanks very much for inviting me, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, this paper uh, or talk is entitled uh, Tao Lu, Credibility and Decipherability in Chinese Martial Movement. So I'm inviting you to take part in a thought experiment with me this afternoon. I would like to provisionally remove all but the most pragmatic definition of Tao Lu. Yes, they are the prearranged movement patterns found in the Chinese martial arts. No, we are not sure what they're for or how to look at them. For the next hour or so, I would like to propose that Tao Lu are Xuan in the orthodox Taoist sense, meaning dark, profoundly mysterious. This is not a prosaic mystery that will eventually be solved. It's an ultimate mystery. It's a feature of our experience that is going to remain impenetrable. I hope that if we consider Tao Lu this way, it will relieve us of the preferences and habits and received wisdom with which we usually understand them. Likewise, should we seem to actually explain Tao Lu in the course of our deliberations, their status as Shren will prevent us from succumbing to the temptation to merely explain them away. My reason for provisionally declaring the most visible and characteristic aspect of Chinese martial arts to be a mystery comes from my own experience. Since 1993, I've practiced several Chinese martial arts, uh, principally Siulum uh, Hong Sing Chole Fut Kun and the practical method or Shi Yong Chuan Fa of Chen Style Taiji. Looking back over two decades of learning, I see that I take Tao Lu for granted at every level of my engagement with Gong Fu. As a teacher and scholar, I have unquestioningly behaved as though Tao Lu are the alembic where the ideal what and how of Chinese martial movement is synthesized, made manifest, refined, presented, and refined again. Taking Tao Lu for granted might be a perfectly adequate stance for practicing, teaching, and theorizing, but realizing my habit, I ask myself, echoing Haruki Murakami when he writes about running, what do I think about when I think about Tao Lu. While the practice is ubiquitous, there is an amazing diversity in its manifestations, and there's very, very little real consensus as to its purpose. British fighter Steve Morris expressed his frustration with Chinese martial arts training in a way that sums up the situation nicely. I'm quoting Steve Morris here. He's a bit older now. Attempting to clearly differentiate within the esoteric boxing forms of Fujian, let alone those of all China, what is combative from that which has its origin in shaman, Taoist, Hindu, Buddhist, magical religious practices, mudra, the depicting of a story, emotion, or action, secret society symbolism, zoomorphic display, qigong gymnastics, the theater, aesthetics, or simply a fanciful display, would prove difficult enough for someone raised in the regional cultures in which these forms originated, let alone a country boy from Penley Dingles, North Wales. While I think he's engaging in a little false modesty at the end there, given how intelligent and able he is, he's made a thorough, if informal, list of ingredients, the imagined combination of which does indeed suggest baffling complexity. But in spite of this, we practitioners continue to entertain opinions, nay, wholehearted convictions about Tao Lu. How are we thinking about them? To begin to answer, I would like to turn to an important branch of 20th century theater practice called the Great Reform. The Great Reform, or Wielka Reforma, is a term invented by Leon Schiller, a Polish theater director, working between the two world wars. It refers to the early 20th century pioneers of theater who developed modernism and the art of the director. Due to fascism, communism, and the world wars, the continuity of this work was lost to Western Europe, the UK, and North America, but was preserved in Eastern Europe, where it was developed by later generations of directors and creators. The most well-known of the artists associated with the Great Reform is Konstantin Stanislavsky, nay Alexeyev, the great Russian actor and theater director who created numerous approaches to actor training during his lifetime, and he left an indelible stamp on the aesthetics of both the Eastern European and the Anglo-American theater traditions. My engagement with the Great Reform, like my relationship to Chinese martial arts, came first as a practitioner. I learned to create theater in one of the many branches of that lineage of artists. A Russian actor named Yuri Zavadsky was taught by Stanislavsky and worked with two of his principal students, Sevalod Meyerhold and Evgeny Vakdangov. 
Zawadzki, in turn, taught a Polish theater director named Jerzy Grotowski, who, in turn, taught an Italian theater director named Eugenio Barba, Canadian director and actor Richard Fowler studied under them and worked with both Grotowski and Fowler, uh, excuse me, and Barba before coming back to Canada where he became my teacher. Like the Chinese martial arts, transmission in the great reform is based on a personal apprenticeship and on sustained immersion in an ensemble or family-like group that practices a daily training. While the aesthetics of the great reform have diversified considerably over the course of the 20th century, they are principally characterized by the requirement that a theatrical performance be meaningful due to the credibility of the actors and the metaphorical staging designed by the director. In his book, which has the Martial Arts Studies Conference friendly title of Theater and Boxing, The Actor Who Flies, Franco Ruffini sets up a pragmatic binary, which he derives from the writings of Stanislavski. We interpret theatrical performances along the two axes of credibility and decipherability. Decipherability asks the question, what does it mean? Credibility asks the question, was it performed in a way I respond to? Ruffini's thesis is that under the aegis of the great reform, acting in the European art theater of the 20th century switched from emphasizing decipherability to the pursuit of credibility as a primary value. I'll return to the great reform later on. Right now, I'd like to consider Taolu from the pragmatic perspectives of credibility and decipherability. If we're not careful when we ask, what does it mean, and was it performed in a way we respond to, we wind up evaluating the authenticity of the material and the competence of the person performing it. Judgments of authenticity and competence are not really my concern here, although martial arts practitioners spend most of their time when they're not practicing martial arts discussing those two things. Uh, our criteria for authenticity are most often derived uh, from styles or styles that we know personally. Excuse me, style or styles that we know personally. And our evaluation of competence usually depends on the range of practitioners we've been able to observe firsthand. So we tend to make very jingoistic assessments. My objective in introducing decipherability and credibility as tools is not to engage in criticism rendered parochial by the limits of our individual experiences. Rather, I hope to use these two ideas to examine how we identify and parse the component elements of Taolu. I propose that parsing Taolu to differentiate their component parts and perceive the relationship between them can be done in two complementary ways. Spatiotemporally, as actions, vectors, and trajectories, and culturally, what significance these movements have held. There are numerous examples of spatiotemporal analyses of Taolu in modern and contemporary Chinese sources, provided by authors like Wan Lai Shun and, uh, more recently, Kang Gu Wu. The specific approach I'd like to focus on today is one that derives the action of Taolu from simple foundational movements. The first exponent, so I hope my video is still coming, yes, uh, to propose analysis in terms of foundational movements is Hong Jun Shun, who was born in 1907 and died in 1996. He was a student of Chen Fa Ke and himself a master of the Chen style of Taiji Chen. Following ideas expressed in Chen Shin's 1933 manual on Chen style Taiji, Hong analyzed the movements of the two principal Taolu of that system and determined that every movement was composed of variations on one of two possible circular hand trajectories. The positive, or Shun circle, when performed with the right hand, moves in a clockwise direction. The negative, or Ni circle, when performed with the right hand, moves in a counterclockwise direction. While this particular movement, done correctly and not informally like I just did, is very specific to Chen style, I feel it's also uh, the positive and negative trajectories can be used more broadly. They're useful in describing a wide swath of movements. Here's my teacher, uh, Chen Zhonghua, demonstrating the two circles. It's a, at the beginning, you do a three count circle. One, two, three. One, two, three. Later, you can go up to nine counts. Let's do a few more counts. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. That's a seven count. And the negative? We do a three count first. In, drop, push, and turn. In, drop, push, and turn. In, drop, push, and turn. So now we do a, a more... 
Hung is not alone in finding two actions at the center of his martial movement training. Contemporary Taiwanese martial artist Zhou Baofu, born in 1951, suggests that all Gong Fu movements are derived from two hand trajectories, which he describes as blocking hand, which moves inward, and sweeping hand, which moves outward. He's using different words, but I believe he's describing the same basic trajectories as Hong. Taiwanese choreographer Lin Huai Min is the founder of the renowned Cloudgate Dance Theater. Mr. Lin. There we go. He's created a synthesis of North American modern dance that he learned at the Martha Graham School in New York in the late 1960s with traditional Chinese movement forms. To this end, he's collaborated with famous Gong Fu teacher Adam Shu and Chen Taiji Chuan teacher Xiong Wei. Lin is more ambitious than Hong and Zhou. He believes that the principal characteristic of all Chinese movement, dance, theater, and martial arts is the sequential execution of two circles, described by Hong and Zhou, in a pattern that's temporally desynchronized. This flower-shaped movement is the basis for all of Lin's work. Here is yours truly demonstrating the flower. Here is an excerpt from a dance piece using that bass movement. Anecdotally, uh, Cloud Geek Dance Theatre came to the National Arts Centre of Canada and uh, his fabulous assistant choreographer gave a workshop and we did that move in every possible plane with our feet on the ground with a partner. It was a, really an exhaustive uh, examination of these two circles. Uh, finally, Lu Suosen, who is a master performer of the martial roles in Beijing Opera and who teaches at the National Academy of Chinese Theatre Arts in Beijing, believes that the movements of his arts are derived from the rotation of two desynchronized circles, a movement that's known as yunshou, or cloud hands. Here, uh, Ms. Shijia Zhang, Lu's apprentice, demonstrates an example of Yunshou found in the second Xiao Wu Tao. These are short fighting sets that uh, novice actors in Beijing opera learn. There is the desynchronized circle. This one's called Protect the Nose. Someone is trying to bonk you in the face at the end of this move. Desynchronized circles. Voila. So, formally, Pragmatically, the idea of deriving all Chinese martial movement from two circular trajectories executed simultaneously, sequentially, or in syncopation is pretty compelling. Personally, I found it very useful as a shortcut when learning new Taolu or for maintaining and remembering old ones. But helpful as this is, these formal analyses remain a posteriori. There's still a vast distance between relatively simple foundational moves and sophisticated choreographies. We can parse Talu into fundamental spatio-temporal units, but can we build them up from such simple beginnings? To accommodate the complexity of Talu, I think we need to look to cultural forms. What did movements made up of fundamental spatio-temporal units mean to their creators? Steve Morris's exasperated list that I mentioned earlier itemizes the cultural activities that are present and represented in Talu. Combative movement, theatrical presentation, and religious inaction. I believe that Taolu have these characteristics for both intended and circumstantial reasons. They are first and foremost palimpsestic and speak in a mix of archaic and contemporary terms. A little familiarity with Taoist ritual in Chinese theater and with the three conflicts that led to the partial erasure of a culture that could recognize these elements, 
the Taiping Rebellion in 1850, the Opera Rebellion in 1854, and the Boxer Rebellion in 1899, allows us to imagine an earlier time when the performance of Tao Lu functions simultaneously as comative training, theatrical entertainment, and religious acts of self-consecration and exorcism. Today, we often lack the interpretive tools to see the vestiges of these elements present in the Tao Lu that we train. We will never know for sure how Tao Lu were understood prior to the late 19th century. Combative, theatrical, and religious ideas are formalized, however, in concrete ways that complement the spatio-temporal ideas that we've just explored. Chances are, if you've learned a Tao Lu, no matter the style, it has some of the following features. It has an opening, which could be the up-out, up-in, down-out, down-in, Kai Zhang of Southern Shaolin. This is from Chole Fut Kun. Every single practice session begins with doing this simple move. Themes and nodes, movements that are repeated along different trajectories, such as Taiji Chuan's Yonsho, Cloud Hands, Chole Fut Kun's Kwa Sao Chop. I don't know if people know Chole Fut. These big arcing moves, you do them in every possible direction. I may be taking out my microphone by doing this, but large sweeping angles that are repeated, varied. Maybe you'd go very, very low while doing one of them, but they are a theme that is readily identifiable. There may be a diagrammatic stepping pattern that creates a two-dimensional shape on the floor. These are frequently derived from religious practice. Here's the original context of walking the nine points of the Luoshu, which is used as a training tool in the martial art of Baguazhang. So here we have a magic square pattern, the lightning flash on the right here, your left, represented traditionally like this, and the officiant is walking that pattern on the ground. Talu may also contain theatrical characters. In this next fragment, General Guan Yu enters, strokes his beard, rides his horse, and sharpens his glaive in the Cholefoot Guandao form. The sequence probably refers to Guan Yu's journey of a thousand miles in the Tale of the Three Kingdoms, where he passed five gates and killed six generals. Probably after killing the six generals, he needed to sharpen his glaive. This is from the late 90s in Montreal. Makes his entrance, sits down, combs his beard. So here he does a little stunt, gets on his horse, gallops, dispatches some generals, <laughs> and sharpens his glaive. In an example that I'm afraid I don't have a video for, uh, the Taoist immortal uh, Liu Dongbin appears in the closing movements of the first section of the Wudang Danpai uh, Liu Duan Jian, the uh, six section sword, essentially sort of boom, he just appears, freezes, and then melts away. As they are all deities, the appearances of these theatrical characters are also religious references. The evocation of deified figures like Guan Yu and Lu Dongbin is considered to have an exorcistic or purifying effect in the Chinese normative religion. Further religious references can be found in the form of shoyin or mudras, such as in the closing movement of the Wudang Danpai Qigong Taiji form. This little movement is called, uh, forgive my pronunciation, Kan Li Ji Ji, or the Qi above and the Qi below reinforces itself. Here we're going to see the shoyin for the fiery heart, which looks a little bit like a deer's head is being balanced by the shoyin for the watery moon. So the position would be like such.
These examples can easily be seen from the outside. Whoops. I don't want you to see them yet. These examples can easily be seen from the outside and pointed out the way I just did. Some structures, however, are more conceptual. So, for example, the Taolu of Hong Junchen's Chen style contains a literary religious reference. The first set, the Yi Lu, contains 81 movements, and the second set, or Ar Lu, has 64 movements, which correspond to the 81 chapters of the Laozi and the 64 chapters of the Zhou Yi. Both are classics of ancient Chinese literature. I'm pretty confident that this list, which is a little bit anecdotal, could be developed substantially. And I, in order to make sure that this was not three hours long, I cut tons of these kinds of examples from the presentation. Um, but the interesting feature is that in addition to being able to add elements, we could also define Taolu by the absence of these elements. So for example, Sholifut Kun is characterized by these really long and theatrical Taolu. Its contemporary, Wing Chun, from about the same time period, has equally structured and sophisticated Taolu, but there are far, far fewer religious and theatrical elements, or at least visible ones in contemporary practice. The selective presence and absence of all these elements give Taolu a rudimentary narrative form. I don't mean that they all tell really clear stories, but they all have clear markers indicating beginnings and endings, themes and variations. Concrete fighting techniques are introduced, repeated, developed, varied. Religious references appear. Theatrical characters are evoked and dismissed. Conceptual meanings and imaginary actions known only to the performer may also be present. So to sum up this part, I'm proposing two axes for considering decipherability in Taolu, spatiotemporal form and cultural form. These axes are pragmatic. We can't claim absolutely that Taolu are composed of pure fighting movements that have subsequently conditioned by cultural practice, or that there are cultural practices that happen to also be very useful for combat training. Exclusive emphasis on either stance jettisons really valuable information and the lived experiences of practitioners. It risks explaining away rather than explaining the complex phenomenon of Taolu. To speak about credibility, which asks the question, was it performed in a way we respond to, attempts to parse what makes a performance of any sort compelling can appear arbitrary, formalist, and sort of nebulous. And yet, we've all had the experience of perceiving a performance as credible, even if we each attribute that credibility quite differently. In 2011, I performed a Taolu at the first international Hong Junchen Tai Chi Chuan seminar and competition on Da Qing Shan in Shandong, China. And I was surprised and uh, extremely pleased to receive a score of 8.6 out of 10. I got a gold medal for my efforts. And my teacher took me aside afterwards, and uh, Chen Zhonghua, who you saw earlier, and explained to me that although this was the highest score in the competition awarded to a foreigner, the parameters on which I had been uh, evaluated were things like the depth of my horse riding stance, my stability on one leg when I went raised a knee, my kick height, the crispness of the sound uh, I made when I slapped my foot when I kicked, and the sharpness of my stops. With out a hint of irony, he said, the actual spatial temporal parameters of Taiji Chuan he's, were unknown to the judges. And so I hadn't been evaluated on them. So the judges found my performance credible, my teacher much less so. Uh, my parameters for credibility were further challenged when I watched the Tui Show athletes comparing to, preparing to compete. Uh, martial arts competitors in China appear to focus either on the presentation of Tao Lu or on various kinds of standing grappling and kickboxing. So the competitive Tui Shou uh, is a grappling sport derived from the partner balance training exercises found in Taiji. Some of us were doing that this morning. Um, but it's a lot more agonistic and it sort of looks like sumo, except it's not done by giant people. And uh, the, the uh, I've lost my spot. Speaking to a few of the competitors, I learned that the professional push hands players in China, they pick two or three throws and do that six to nine hours a day. They really are uh, imp immovable. It's like wrestling with an iron statue. I went in and was you know, promptly crushed, and, and they polished the mat with me a few times. It was, it was very, uh, very instructive. <laughs> but they rarely, if ever, practice Taolu. But in order to qualify to compete, they have to demonstrate a Taolu. 
And uh, again, I was incredibly surprised watching these guys qualify because they weren't able to perform Taolu credibly at all. They forgot movements, they got stuck in repetitive loops and sort of had to be coached from the side by their, uh, their handlers. Uh, you know, they stuck their bums out and craned their necks. They looked, uh, locked out their arms. They looked truly dreadful. Encased in the uh, structural demands of the Taolu, they entirely lost the sort of predatory menace and feline grace that really impressed me when I was actually standing face to face with them. They could not transfer the powerful credibility they demonstrated in their wrestling to their Taolu. A strong attempt to structurally identify what we are actually responding to uh, when we attribute credibility to performance has been proposed by the theater director Eugenio Barba, a gentleman with white hair who I showed earlier. Theater specialists present are doubtless already familiar with these ideas, but I'm going to sketch them briefly for everyone. Uh, I mentioned him earlier as an artist emerging from the Great Reform. Eugenio Barba is the Italian-born director of a Danish theater company called Odin Teatret, an ensemble that he founded in 1964 and with which he has directed 28 performances. He's also published prolifically on theater. In 1980, inspired by the rigorous training of such traditional Asian dance theater forms as Kadakali, Japanese No, Indonesian Topang, Chinese Jingju, he had seen, while he was on tour, he uh, gathered a group of master performers uh, from these different traditions for a month-long workshop. I think they were in an abandoned school in Berlin, which was then not unified. During this workshop, he asked them to teach each other and the participants what they'd learned on the first day of their apprenticeship, which for many of them was when they were small children. Viewing all the different exercises, he felt that although the results of the training varied from uh, style to style, the performers all sought a sort of similar goal. They used their trained physicality to create a way of moving that captured their audience's attention. He theorized that the principal goal of rigorous training was to create the attribute of stage presence. Pre-sense, what draws us to a performer's actions before we can attribute meaning to them. In Ruffini's terms, credibility is presence, which, according to Barba, precedes decipherability. Barba has named this level of the performer's practice pre-expressive behavior, and he describes it in terms of four principles. The first is the principle of balance. Performers use positions and ways of movement that are precarious and more effortful to maintain than those used in daily life. Because they have control of their balance, they can move in unexpected directions without signaling their intent. As they can change at any time, we watch them. Principle number two, principle of opposition. An opposition can be spatial or temporal. Spatially, lines of tension divide the body, creating potential energy. My earlier example, Everything below my waist is going down, everything above my waist is going up. Very, very simple example of an opposition in the horizontal plane. It can also be temporal. I can signal to the left and then move to the right. I'm telling you, look over here. No, look over there. Everyone has seen cartoons. The roadrunner suspended over the uh, empty gulch before falling. You know, this kind of opposition in time. Number three, a bit of a mouthful. Works well in Italian and French, in English, not so great. The principle of consistent inconsistency. This refers to the internal coherence of the performer's choices. In the case of a codified system, like Chinese theater, the idiosyncrasies of the form apply to all the practitioners and recur thematically throughout the repertoire. In less strictly codified genres, like cinema acting or clowning, physical theater, contemporary dance, the performer's personal idiosyncrasies are contextualized for performance and become an expressive vocabulary. Number four, the principle of equivalency. Everyday actions are decomposed and restructured in order to make them more visible and visceral than they would be in daily life. To use a prosaic example, I'll take a sip of water, because it's really hot, and uh, daily behavior, little effort as possible. To make this fact that I'm drinking water, which is really refreshing, meaningful to a large audience, I will decompose it into discrete phases to make it more visible. Small, nevertheless, visible to a larger number of people. 
I found these principles to be great pedagogical tools for actors, dancers, and martial arts in training. Balance and opposition are as important to a beginning student uh, assimilating postures and stepping patterns as they are to an intermediate student practicing fighting games with a partner. Personal and stylistic idiosyncrasies and the relationship between them can be perceived easily by examining the principle of consistent inconsistency. If we look at equivalency, we can consider how everyday movement is transformed into martial prowess and vice versa. Despite their usefulness, my experience is that these principles don't help us answer the question, why are some performers more interesting to watch than others? Rather, they answer the question, how have performers trained in order to be credible for audiences? The difference between why and how is a key one for me. As an artist, I've found that asking how is a lot more practical than asking why. How do I acquire a particular skill? How do I choose and then practice a particular method? How do I differentiate between different methods? How do I express the fruition of my practice by making artworks? My ongoing question with respect to credibility has to do with causality. How is the immediately credible causality of two Tai Chi Chuan players wrestling freely and spontaneously reflected in a set solo choreographic sequence? This transfer is germane to both the practice of Tao Lu and to theater practice, where actors and dancers need to repeat known sequences of movement and behavior night after night while reliably retraining their credibility. Here are my younger Taiji brothers, Brennan To and John Doms. They're practicing, it's actually an edited series of clips of them practicing competitive Tui Show. Brennan is really trying to trip and throw John, and John is really trying, not very successfully, to stop him. I'll just bring this back up. So as John falls over, Brennan's actions are credible in the most fundamental sense, and the causality of this exchange is really clear. Whoop. My stops are not very long. In the early 2000s, I began to develop exercises for actors and dancers using partner games from Choli Foot Kun and Taiji Tren. My objective was to find a way to maintain the credible causality created by physical contact when the performers were not touching, going from the credibility of a concrete result on a partner, like we just saw, to the more subjective credibility of indirect action across space via nonverbal and eventually verbal communication. Over time, I differentiated our games into two main categories, avoidance and entanglement. When players are touching, avoidance and entanglement are striking, where you avoid being hit, and grappling, where you welcome becoming entangled. But as larger metaphors, they embrace interpersonal actions, both physical and social. In the spring of 2009, I was awarded a three-year research creation grant by the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. This grant offered artists working in the university system funding for practical artistic research. I used this grant to found my studio, Les Ateliers du Corps, which reads in English the Workshops of the Body, roughly translated, which for the first three years was a small group of emerging artists who met for nine hours a week to learn the curriculum of performer training that I had assembled. Each year in the spring, we spent a further four weeks working full time prior to presenting a professional dance theater performance as the outcome of that year's training and creation activities. The participants in Les Ateliers du Corps learned the Chen style of Taiji Chen both from me and from Chen Zhonghua, who happily visits Ottawa quite regularly. And I had the chance to see the effect of training in both Orthodox Chen style and the kinds of games that I'd been developing myself. These games initially actually lent themselves to creating interesting staging and choreography. So here's a fragment from a performance that we made called Nor the Cavaliers Who Come With Us. Uh, I created and directed this in residence at the National Theatre School of Canada. Here, improvised partner entanglement about a single wooden staff is used to dramatize the many battles led by the conquistador Hernán Cortés as he fought his way from the coast to the Mexica capital of Tenochtitlan during the uh, conquest of Mexico. The text that he is speaking is a translation of something called the Spanish Requirement of 1513. It was a declaration by the Spanish monarchy of Spain's divinely ordained right to take possession of the territories of the New World and to subjugate, exploit, and, when necessary, to fight the native inhabitants. 
this requirement was read in Spanish to Native Americans to inform them of Spain's right of conquest. Uh, those who subsequently resisted conquest were considered to harbor evil intentions. We took the title of the performance from the uh, requerimento, this requirement. Apparently, they, you know, they would recite this and then translate it, and whole villages would go bananas and attack them. So they took to, you know, they'd find a nice hill uh, and recite it far from the village in the middle of the night, uh, in the dark, facing backwards, and thus satisfying the royal requirements, but not getting themselves into a big battle. Here we go. Whoop. Let me pass up. The effect I'd hope to create by not actually setting the individual movements of the fight over the staff, so everything you saw is choreographed up to the moment when they actually start wrestling over the staff, uh, was to create a kind of uh, tribute to the spontaneity and precision shown by these students at the National Academy of Chinese Theater Arts in Beijing. They are using set fragments of known attacks and reposts to improvise and mutually decide in the moment on the content and conclusion of their encounter. So what you're about to see looks like something that is very set and isn't. The next fragment is from a performance that I created at the 2010 Canada Dance Festival, which is a national festival that takes place in Ottawa every spring. In this example, two performers set the result of an improvised entanglement game in order to create a duet. The performance is named Circe, Landfall, and it's based on the myth of Circe from Homer's Odyssey. Instead of Odysseus's men being transformed into pigs by Circe the witch, in our version, a single hallucinating shipwrecked stranger is discovered washed up on the beach by a lonely woman. In this clip, our Circe talks to herself and her conflicting inner voices are played by two performers. As Ottawa is on the border of Ontario and Quebec, some of the performers spoke English and some of the performers spoke French. So this scene is bilingual.
my combined experiences, il y a une personne qui a compris la blague. <laughs> my combined experiences of training and teaching martial arts and theater leads me to conclude provisionally that credibility is a function of interactivity. When we interact with a parameter, be it another person, a cultural enactment such as a theatrical figure or a religious narrative, or a series of impersonal movement variables, our focus is on something outside of ourselves. This gives us the space we need to interact with the multiple variables that Taolu conjure. When we perform and watch Taolu, we each privilege different kinds of interactivity. We might expect Taolu to be credible in terms of our existing repertoire of fighting techniques and power generation methods, but there are always techniques and methods of which we will be ignorant. We can examine the credibility of Taolu with respect to cultural information or with respect to our knowledge of fundamental human movement. Both Taolu and the perceptual apparatus with which we receive them are also palimpsestic. To the extent we interact with different tacit world spaces, so the various world spaces of Taolu become available to our perceptions. Questions that might then allow our attributions of credibility to become more conscious and nuanced would then include, what does the Taolu suggest we should interact with? What does the Taolu suggest we should interact with? How does it accomplish this? How is the player interpreting those suggestions? We won't necessarily get exhaustive answers, but we'll come closer to understanding our own parameters and the gaps in our experience. I'll show you a final slide, which has a nice little chart of all the things that we discussed. And I'm going to stop here. I think I have outlined the things I think about when I think about Taolu. I welcome your questions, and I thank you very much for your attention. And I wrote a book. <laughs> and they didn't give me any cards to put on the table, so I thought I'd show it to you now. Mm. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about the training technique of in improvised entanglement? I understand the principle, but I'm interested in how you're, you know, a similar question that I've asked other, other presenters yeah. today. Oh, so there's two levels to this. First, I think, is I had a kind of self-selecting group of uh, enthusiastic amateurs and em emerging artists who, you know, they wanted to be there. So there's a lot of uh, willingness to put in time. And very concretely, that game of entanglement, if you come up here, I'll show you really quickly, and it'll give everyone an idea. Um, it's really, really simple. So if we stand face to face, um, I will make a kind of frame. So I have negative spaces, frame, <laughs> beside my head, beside my legs, and between them. I would ask my partner to step into one of those spaces and take two grips on me. Okay. So I Great. Now, could you manipulate me just to the edge of my balance? So just before I fall over, and I'm going to be quite compliant with what he's doing. So, yep. So now, he is a nice training partner, and he stops, and he lets go of my arm. So I'm allowed to remain in position. So your hands as well. So it just loosens the grip. I now have, I'm allowed one step and two grips. So I'll go in, find something, and I'm going to rotate him. He's going to be reasonably pliable. Just where I feel like he's going over, I'm going to stop. His turn. You got one step and two grips. So you can extract yourself, for example. I can then come in, decide I'm going to try this. He's got his next one. Gradually, that was two, steps. Yeah, was two steps. You can, yeah, there's a lot of cheating. Um, very gradually, 
we uh, get to the point where, and I mean, we could do this, but let's not. Okay. <laughs> um, we, can, we get to the point where we're being proactive. So just before he winds me, I think, oh, he's going over there. I'm going over here. And we can uh, dance quite lightly around one another. And we get used to adjusting to uh, a numerous series of variables. First of all, I learn how this particular person who I'm going to work with, how his body works, what his timing is, what his sense of space is. Uh, I can feel the sharp corner of the table over there through him because I can feel his feet and the kind of way he's protecting his back. Uh, any number of spatial things. On top of this, we also figure out how the human body works from someone else's perspective. So uh, the Zhou Baofu, the circling guy I mentioned at the beginning, had a great explanation. He said, oh, Talu is not for you. It's to teach you how other people move. So in a way, this is sort of an equivalent of thing. I'm figuring out how someone in my ensemble moves. I'm also learning to respond to error and the unexpected. When you're performing, those are the only real two constants. You try and set everything to have real constants. But typically, the show is a series of things that go wrong and things you didn't plan. And uh, you're dealing with that. If you spend a lot of time improvising in the studio, you become somewhat more adept at covering and changing. This also can be something that creates a type of uh, choreographic procedure. An exercise that I've done with people is have uh, the partner and I, or two partners, set a whole series. So, you know, first one, he manipulated me here. We record it. He manipulated me here. I know this. It's now part of a set. I go in and do this. He responds in kind. We wind up with a kind of matched partner set that we record so we can do it again and again. And we separate. And I have all of these movements on the air that I know how they felt when someone actually did them to me. So hopefully they become a little bit more credible, a little bit more wired to the sensory experience of my spatial mind embracing my partner as I work. So in theory, in huh. theory that's where all the problems come from, so, right? Like that's yes. We're, we're taking them from that practical moment. Yeah, I have, you know, there's no way of knowing. Right. And uh, there's all kinds of other possible sources for Taolu. Um, I think that's a different paper is nailing down what those sources might be. <laughs> um, I'm, taking, I'm really taking for granted there's a great variety. But that type of play where you set up some sort of parameter and uh, you, know, you can do that quite fast and furious if you have soft mats. People can actually knock each other over and see what was, you know, it felt sort of like leverage or was I just, you know, I was just falling over because I'm suggestible because I know this is an exercise where I'm supposed to lose my balance. So you can work on that degree of credibility as well. Um, that, was, that was a main component. And the other components were things that uh, you would recognize from a normal, I don't know if it's a, is that, that's a terrible phrase, a normal martial arts class, I will not say that. Um, positions, uh, fundamental movements, fundamental movements that step, um, et cetera, et cetera. An awful lot of rhythmic work, a lot of, uh, a lot of song, um, things that integrate the body with the sound it's making. Is that a good, yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Chef Sal Tai Chi, you, know, you mentioned that uh, there are all of these different variables that are going to define what we might view of you as being credible. Mm -hmm. Presumably, the people uh, looking at the, uh, the Choi Lee's foot mm -hmm. form are focusing on a different set of variables and not more of the, the theatrical things going mm -hmm. on. Have you thought a little bit of, at all about what pushes the martial art in one direction or another direction in terms of? Yeah. You know, and that's how I'm going to define, you know, my credibility versus, you know, I am going to be, I'm going to strip all that out. Yeah. You know, have you found any kind of social variables or, or regional variables or temporal variables that seem to kind of correlate with those sorts of... It's a lovely question, and I think it's actually one that you know more about than I do, but uh, the context in which things were originally done, uh, I have a strong feeling that the original Choi Foot practitioners, they were a bit tied in with the Taiping Rebellion. They were also doing a whole series of uh, village level 
presentations tied in with the annual cycle of festivals. So there's a good chance that most of the people who did it performed Kung Fu in their uh, festivals far more than they ever got into fisticuffs. So that could, demonstrating that prowess, like I can do, uh, we were talking uh, with Graham about the, the boxing forms, uh, different, the other branch of Chole Foot. I saw one that went on for 16 minutes at speed. Like, you're just demonstrating incredible martial prowess when you can do a I, Of course, it's very useful to have that many variations on your fighting techniques and be that fit. But 16 minutes at speed, it's oh, you know, you're just demonstrating incredible prowess. So I imagine it's the context that really shapes that. You know, uh, if there's a great demand for lion dancing, suddenly we get really, really good at that because that's something that people are, we're fulfilling the social work of our school is going around and doing all these different kinds of uh, community ritual activities. So I imagine that it's very contextual. It's probably really flexible. You know, you might have the same system that within a generation or just two, two students of the same teacher might find themselves in different contexts and things would, uh, would develop accordingly. Uh, uh, Lung Kai, who was the Cholifut teacher of my teacher, there were all this ritual stuff of how to wake up a lion's head. He would hold a paintbrush in the basic Cholifut stance, recite a spell, you know, go down and uh, dot the eyes to wake it up. Uh, things that are now in North America, at least in Montreal where that was done, it's lost. But there's less need for lion dancing in Montreal than there was in Hong Kong. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, and one thing you, you didn't talk about that I think is pretty interesting um, is the, the role of um, body training in producing sound. Yeah. Uh. Um, and I was wondering if you could. I kind of actually, uh, there's a paragraph that I cut. I don't know if I. Uh, ben, how much time do I have? Oh, yeah. Do I have time to dig this out? Hang on a sec. Oh, wow, okay. Please bear with me as I attempt to... Uh... <laughs> da, 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 da. Huh, it's not there. I, I won't search for this right now. Something that I noticed uh, and is not actually, uh, Graham who's sitting in the front row also did a different subset of Chole Foot and so we were just exchanging prior to this presentation. I said, what about the sounds? And Graham's like, what sounds? So even there, something that I could consider very, very standard. Um, what I noticed with Chole Foot training is that there were, they use um, really precise syllables for different directions. So if you do the rising snap kick, you say T-D-I-K. If you have a lowering um, of the, it's usually a huja, the tiger claw going down, and anything that is going along the sort of horizontal plane, because I, so those three cries make your body vibrate. They make your body vibrate in the spot where you're hitting the other person. Like the ideal, the, the eventual vector of this, if I hit someone in the groin, which is the purpose, it's gonna vibrate right here. Right? The line will go straight up the center column of their body. And uh, so when I go, you know, I get a little vibration in the top of my head. That's where that vector is supposed to wind up in the other person. Similarly, down or the hop vibrates a bit more here. This doesn't vibrate much because it's full of liquid. But, uh, and then the middle, uh, the middle vibrates quite a lot with that, uh, that, those, all those sort of round hooking things. So what I noticed after not doing very much voice training for the first three years that I did Chole Foot, I then thought, well, I better you know, work on my vocal chops. And I just had this colossal voice that didn't have the fatigue problems that I noticed a lot of my uh, colleagues had. And similarly, when I was at the uh, National Academy of Chinese Theater Arts, th I asked uh, Lu Suo Sen, who we saw earlier, could you share with me some of the vocal training? And he did a few vocalese, you know, like ma, 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 this kind of stuff, just scales. And I said, yes, there are more, because Beijing opera training is so extensive. And he said, well, we sing the repertoire. And I said, yeah, is there any more? And he started doing stretch kicks. And I went, oh, it's a system. So the whole system of body preparation embraces, I think, the voice. It's just probably not used all the time. 
but it's sitting there uh, in potential. That would be my answer. <laughs> Yeah, sure. The one thing that's really been on my mind is the first tip that you showed yeah. the Chinese guy. Yeah. Saying a beginner needs to know which server is better than that. Yes. Which server is better than that? Uh, yeah. Um, I've watched that whole film. He doesn't answer that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it struck me as strange that he said that. I think uh, I. What I understood from the context in which he said it was, people would ask the naive question of, you know, which half of, you know, is it, is it, uh, you know, is it better to breathe in or breathe out? <laughs> you know, like these kinds of naive questions about the the functioning of the system. So I think that contextually he's saying that's uh, in Chen style, according to Joseph Chen, the positive circle is easier to get. The negative circle, which is your punch, is harder to get. But hey, it's your punch. So um, we could maybe make a, a case for the negative. I'm joking here. Uh, we could make a case for the negative circle, but uh, not entirely sure. Uh, sure. Um, I, I was struck in the beginning when you said Kalu is a mystery, but it's not a prosodic mystery, it's not a prosaic mystery. Yeah. It's not one that we will yeah. solve. Um, I've been thinking a lot, which is what I'll talk about also tomorrow, about the, the kind of objects that are studied in, in scientific research and how similar. Mm-hmm. How similar do you think it is in the sense of the, 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 the Kalu that as you go through it over the years perhaps, or also developing it over generations, that it's kind of like you're going into something that's concrete. Mm -hmm. So it's then it's less of a mystery, it's more like something unknown, but it does unfold to you. Or is that the prosaic version that it's not? Uh, that's also a good question. I think what happens as you go down from the atomic level to the subatomic, I don't know if I'd really say I'm at the subatomic level of practice, but um, as the scale, of the, the depth of magnification increases, um, I think it moves away from our ability to express it to the uninitiated in language. So everything I put in this presentation, I feel like even if you don't do Taiji, Chinese martial arts, or theater, you have some sense of what I was talking about. I think as we nuance the, uh, our experience of Taolu, you can get into things where people who have a common experience can talk to each other, and then people who are very experienced and have something in common can talk to each other, and very, very gradually, language becomes a bit problematic because it's really hard to speak universally. I think that's a research problem for this kind of context where everybody's got some, well, not necessarily everybody, I'm making a bit of an assumption, but everybody has some kind of uh, physical or embodied experience, are they correlate or not? And we use words that we are assuming the other people mean the same stuff, but we don't know. So, yes, it certainly continues. I don't think it's prosaic that, you know, you have an intuition that it's just coming and you get new information or you discover you were completely mistaken and you have to go back and start something again. I think that's a deep experience of its mysterious nature that you know you're not ever going to get bored and run out of stuff yeah uh, one of the um, ideas that i had mm -hmm. this conference but i didn't get around to actually organizing it was to do some kind of physical workshop where various problems of language like mm -hmm. how do you um uh, like louis bacon says says you know he's writing about boxing and says how do you translate Yeah. 
and then maybe maybe it's something to do next year, mm -hmm. and, and then get together and have a kind of plenary roundtable discussion about mm -hmm. about the ability to communicate, and then the question is whether that's communicable to people who who, who don't know, like like uh, who, who've never grappled, like, mm -hmm. and who've never danced, or who've never mm -hmm. juggled. Like, yeah, there, I, I think there are also key words that it would be nice to find alternatives to. I tried really hard, I may have missed, but I tried not to use the word forms meaning taolu in this presentation because I think everyone goes to sleep when they hear that word. They're like, oh yeah, I know what that is. And it's right? So how can we use language that doesn't already have these kinds of assumptions? Uh, and you can get, you, you have assumptions instead of experience? Like, you know, I done like four months of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, so what I know about grappling fits in a really small place. Before I did it, I had this idea of what grappling was because I'd read about grappling, because grappling's really an important topic in martial arts. So there was this kind of response that I had that was based on absolutely nothing except uh, anecdotal information that I'd, third-hand information. The word grappling changed for me substantially, but it's still such, a, it's such common usage and uh, you know, people who've done a lot of it will have a very, very different response. So even there, how do we clean up the language? I, I think it's a great project. Um, I think it's going to raise more questions and discover, you might figure out how that particular group <coughs> communicates. That's probably the first thing you'll discover, and that's probably really worthwhile doing. So please do. <laughs> I'll come. <laughs> Sure. I'm quite interested in the idea of credibility. Yeah. Which is a theme we get going back to. Do you think the, um, the traditional martial arts have a credibility issue? And what's the answer to this? Um, I think that's a, a little bit of a social functional question. The kind of credibility I was speaking about here is really on the, uh, the individual level. Like when I see as we were playing around before, when I see you doing the chole foot, is my eye drawn to you? Do I want to see you finish your, your phrase? The larger do traditional martial have a credibility issue. Um, they might. I kind of personally don't care because I just like them. Um, Ben's conversation about, uh, remember, this is just for fun. Uh, I might not put it quite that way, but I think that's probably a big part of my engagement is I just really enjoy this. And uh, it, it seems a little part of my curiosity about, and talking about Taolu is from a strict perspective of uh, striking and grappling, perhaps one could do Muay Thai and that would be a better use of one's time. <laughs> Why learn these elaborate choreographies? Um, that's the kind of credibility issue that I think you might be raising here. And is that what you mean? That well, link. Yeah. I think if you observe something and you think it has credibility, yeah. Yeah. So I think there's, there's been an issue. Yeah, I think I would come back to my uh, perhaps a little bit snaky and uh, flexible answer that I raised at the end of it's uh, it's about interactivity. So the credibility really is within you know interlocking with what it does does it have credibility? So uh, interlocking with people who already share an interest, the <laughs> credibility quite high. As, uh, as, a pra as, a, as an occupation, as a hobby, as a ac human activity, a serious leisure, I think there's a high credibility. Perhaps across our current cultural preoccupations, there's less things for it to lock into, so there's less credibility. There can be whole things that are lost, like the whole religious component, which seems to have uh, taken a huge hit at the turn of the century. So there's a possibility for the crumbling of credibility. So probably my answer is yes, especially if we look at it over the last 150 years. It, you know, one kind of credibility goes away, perhaps another presents itself, the national identity construction that Ben was talking about this morning. It's uh, wheels within wheels, I think, would be the answer. Could you say, can I just push on that for a second? Could you say something more about non-credibility? Because it's like if the interactivity oh. is grappling, I'm totally with you. Yeah. Then it becomes grappling with an imaginary partner, and the experience is like, oh, ah. so go there. Then it just becomes grappling with like the social structure of religion. It's like, so then who is it that's not Wow, that, 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 that sounds really deep, and I just, I'm yeah, not I, smart I, enough to understand you. Do that again? <laughs> well, I, I always think that that trope of like the person who's not engaging with something, 
uh, the person who's typing or, or not is, is actually kind of failing to see what the person is grappling with in some way. So I'm, asking, I'm like pushing on the idea that, that it can be more or less interactive, and so there might be someone who's practicing like how you're coming and who's not interacting. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's going to be, I don't know if that's going to be really, wow, that's a big, uh, big. I'm not sure if that's possible. I think in context of Graham's question, which was about is the social institution of traditional martial arts suffering from a credibility problem, I would say p perhaps it does because there are fewer things for it. Uh, there's fewer venues to appreciate it than there might have been in the past. Those venues have been modified, et cetera. Uh, I think what you're discussing is our, you know, I'm doing a performance, 17 people are watching me like a hawk, one person is not grabbed, what's happening with that person? Um, that is, a, I think, an, a different issue. Uh, can I have an, an experience that isn't interactive while doing a taolu? Maybe, but I mean, I'm interacting with my boredom. If I go into like the sort of gray zone while I'm, yeah, I'm still interacting. It's just, I'm interacting with a sea of gray in my mind. I'm not sure if that's even, I'm still interacting, right? Yeah. Scott loves boredom. Yeah. I just sort of hit backwards. Yeah, that's the goal, buddy. Uh -huh. here, I am portraying emptiness right here. You got it. Yeah. This is connected. That's what uh -huh. I'm saying. The gray zone versus the emptiness. Well, I'm just thinking of a, of a comment that uh, made to me when I was being bounced around periodically by this uh, Chinese player. Yeah. And, Yeah. And we're good buddies with all these Wu style guys. And he said, Well, Wu style is a, is a Quen Pa. Quen Pa, you know, it's a, it's a civilized. Yes. It's civilized martial arts. Yeah. It's not like what I do. Right. Right? But, of course, Xi Yi has its own Tao right? Yeah. <laughs> it's got its own system. So, so for him, that Tao that he would see us do is, was not cred credible yeah. within this, this sort of micro audience. Mm -hmm. We have these imaginative worlds we're operating in, yeah. um, and you know, civilized versus practical. But even within those, we have all these sort of variations on maybe what that means. We just we just don't really have a shared vocabulary. Maybe that that's that's part of what mm -hmm. is credible or not. Really. I think everybody seems to be skirting around the same subject, but in terms of uh, a shared language, there may be. What's interesting is when you began, you began talking about. Uh huh. You began, began with something that was ge geometrically very, very simple. Yeah. So as a level of, or a way of expressing things universally across all martial arts, what you could look to do then was to skip it straight back to something that is ge geometric and then look at possibly running a function that sits behind it. At least then you can, or a, a point is always a point, a triangle is always a triangle, a straight mm -hmm. line is always a straight line, a curve is always a curve. Those are things that are synonymous with every type of fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. And then the gray areas that come out of, you know, you're talking about expressing uh, um, <coughs> even fighting with yourself uh, or, or grappling with yourself or not grappling with the partner shares a parallel as a uh, two discussion points. One was the fact that when you were being assessed by your teacher, then uh, he was saying that it was only, you know, uh, you were being assessed on uh, peripherals or things mm -hmm. that didn't share the depth of the things that he could perceive and see. Mm -hmm. The first thing that you, the first thing that you, you talked about was, I'm going to take a shape and now I run negative space. That's yeah. really interesting. Mm -hmm. People always look at the form, don't they? They're not always looking at the negative space that sits within the form itself. But that would maybe be a, a place to start in terms of assessing the universal language, which also ties in with uh, Martin's stuff on mm -hmm. the on the five element uh, uh, breakdown of the of the, uh, of the yin yang. You 
which again is entirely relevant to what you were talking about before because it uh, it runs straight back into the Dao, which mm-hmm. is where this Dao Lewis spawned from. So maybe that would be a starting point where everybody could find some common ground or some type of synthesis as a as a starting point of building. Something that I think follows that as an as a, a research topic that probably I'll try and do, but if anyone wants to help, is I think there are any number of, quote, modernist martial arts practitioners who've done that kind of, uh, like the, the circles of uh, Hong Junshun and Chen Zhonghua, that, that particular school of Chen style, which is all about kind of math and geometry. I imagine that that's not unique. And there might be a whole bunch of people who've already done that work within their own practice framework and getting a sense of, hey, there's like 20 of these, and then look, looking at them together. Because that mathematical way of thinking, I think, is a very early to mid 20th century way of, of thinking. It seems to have come across uh, both Asia and Europe in uh, the, an- the analysis of dance, uh, modern dance. There's a R- Rudolf Laban, eight basic effort actions, right? Human movement is eight things. I, it might be a little, you might laugh and think it's a little reductive, but this type of thinking was really common. And at, a, uh, at a, approximately the same time, like Hong Jun Shun is the turn of the century, Laban's a bit later, yeah. So probably I'm not fudging the dates too badly. So it would be really cool to see all of these approaches within that time period that have this sort of mathematical kind of uh, outlook. Thank you.